but without further ado, I'd love to get into uh, this incredible next panel. Um, I've been hearing about you, Bobak, for years now um, as the man with the plan uh, and the best hair in the business. Um, you are uh, a resident genius in these parts, and we're so uh, grateful to have you. Ah, I'm so glad to be here. It's, it's fun to finally participate because I've given some ideas for uh, you know, scavenger uh, events in the past. And so it's super exciting to finally like get to hang out. Yeah, so well, uh, I'm not gonna talk too much, but um, we'd love it if you would take us through a little bit on the bot building. So we have a challenge in the hunt. Um, I think that was uh, sent over to you as well to make a really simple robotic device, but we'd love it if you could help us understand the parts and what's part and parcel yeah. to creating a robot. There, uh, it's gonna be a pretty simple robot. You don't need a fancy motor or anything. You're gonna use a, a rubber band as your motor. Um, what you'll need is a pen, uh, a rubber band, and preferably two screws. You can try this with nails, but the screws help because they'll hold the rubber band in place along the grooves. Um, so if you take those things together and I'll walk you through how to build that um, whenever whenever you guys want. We can do that at the start, we can do that at the end, uh, whatever works Yeah, best. you know what? Um, there's a link in the challenge that sort of shows how to build a simple robot, but why don't we do it with you because you're the expert and we are, we're yeah. here to learn from you. All right, we're gonna disassemble our pen. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. You just, I've got a, the screw type, but you can kind of do this however you want. And I'm just gonna need, sorry, I'll put that up here. I'm just gonna need this little tube section to hold everything. And then what we're gonna do after that is we're gonna thread this rubber band through this. And that takes a little bit more skill than you'd imagine because the rubber band really wants to stick to the sides of this plasticky tube. So I'm gonna grab the, the pen tip to sort of help it navigate it. And you guys can kind of see, like I'm just gonna sort of see through here. But if I grab this, there I go. I have it now on both ends. So I have the little loop. And grab the first of my screws and kind of place that rubber band about halfway along the screw so that we can see that. And while I hold that in place and grab the other screw and do the same thing, it doesn't matter which direction you get. Um, and then all you need to do really here is you're just gonna have to twist a lot. So while we're twisting, why don't we talk about some other stuff? I'm just gonna be twisting for a while um, to get some tension into this rubber band. Um, so for those of you guys who don't, I can just chat about me for a while if you guys want. For those of you who don't know who I am, um, I'm an engineer. My day job is working at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And I got my start working on robotic spacecraft there about 18 years ago. Um, very exciting stuff. So the very first mission I got to work on was the Mars Curiosity rover, um, which I worked on from 2003 to 2012. Um, and for, for folks who don't know what the lab does, we basically for almost all the um, extraplanetary, so like the Mars missions, the Jupiter missions, um, you know, the Saturn missions, everything, that kind of stuff, almost all of those we've, uh, we've been at least part of or built uh, at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, and so we kind of do a lot of the stuff that doesn't have people on it uh, to places where people can't quite go yet. We're obviously hoping that soon there'll be people to follow behind our robots. Um, and I work uh, particularly in two kind of key areas, but the, the exciting part that I work on is how spacecraft can fail. Um, we call that fault protection. So if you can imagine all these robots that are out there on their own, um, one of the incredibly challenging parts is of course, we don't have a mechanic or anybody else to help us once we're out there. We have just us on the ground who can talk to it. But even when we talk to it, most of these things are so far away that it takes the communications minutes or hours to get back to us. So if you think about like a critical activity, um, it can't wait for a human necessarily to like hear about it and then to send some commands back. Even if you think about Mars, Mars is anywhere from four to 20 minutes away. So round trip, that's eight to 40 minutes. Um, that's a long time in the, uh, in the thing. I'll, I'll go back, I see there's a question about the first step. So while, while we're talking about this, well, I, uh, the first step was to disassemble a pen. So I have two pens here, but basically what I took was the, um, kind of the grippy part of it in the middle here. I threaded a rubber band through it. Uh, and then into the loops that were extending from both sides, I have put here, I put a screw um, into both sides. And all I'm doing now is just twisting this so that we get a lot of tension on this little kind of rubber band motor that we're gonna make here. And I am trying this with you guys. This, this I tried it out a little earlier, it works. 
Um, some people will probably have more or less success depending on the rubber band and the screws and everything else they use, but this should work a little bit. Um, so going back to the kind of robotic stuff, I, uh, yeah, just like looking at how spacecraft can fail and figuring out how that works, um, which is just an incredible way to learn. You know, I, I joke with my parents, they let me take apart a lot of electronics when I was a kid and figure out how things work. And the best way to figure out how things work is to break them, um, sadly, because then you have to repair them and really understand how they work. So that's why your car mechanics work so well. Um, so that's my job. So I worked on, on the Curiosity mission. I worked on the Cassini mission at Saturn. Um, very briefly worked on the Kepler mission that was looking for planets around other stars. We found you know, over 3,000 planets um, around other stars, which is uh, just a wild thing to be part of. Um, I got to you know, be part of the Curiosity landing. Um, so that's where a lot of people, uh, I think, saw, saw me because it was a, you know, obviously an exciting event for a lot of people. Um, and uh, now I work on a mission called NISAR, which is an Earth orbiting mission. And actually, it's a partnership with India. So it's very exciting to, to kind of be able to help out there today. Um, who's ready to I mean, test this? I don't know. Are you guys, you guys want to kind of see if this works? I'm going to put this on a stand here, and we're going to set this down. And let's see if I, yeah, it kind of, kind of walks there a little bit. This is not the best stand. I might need to keep tightening this, so we'll, we'll keep talking about other stuff for a while. Um, all right, let me answer some questions here from the thing. What qualifies as a robot? That is a good question. I am, you know, weirdly, even though I've been doing this for a while, um, I don't have an incredible answer um, about what a robot really is. Uh, for, for me, it's really, uh, the way I kind of define it, it's a, a, a um, device that can kind of operate on its own. Um, so I, weirdly enough, and I don't think this is by any means correct, I also think of like radios and your computers almost as robots, um, because not all robots necessarily have a moving part, right? I still think of like our spacecraft, um, and many times don't have to have many moving parts for us to consider them robots. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we still need to operate them and they still need to be able to kind of work on their own, uh, without us. And so, uh, you know, this is a kind of a simple one. It's a mechanical robot. It doesn't have the computer computational thing, but it's still going to, Hopefully, walk along uh, itself and uh, and demonstrate that it's you know its ability to do a little task um, independently of me, right? Basically, once I set it, it should be able to do something without me um, constantly kind of supervising, right? Not not directly operated by a human, um, in which case, right, a car wouldn't necessarily qualify as a robot unless it was a self-driving car, I guess. Um, all right, I th I'm hoping that I've tightened this enough. It's been a lot of times. Uh, this will be a lot easier if you have a slightly shorter rubber band, but then the hard part will be getting it through the hole here all right no no, no my, my lost a lot of tension walk walk little friends walk i don't know if i have the best surface let's see if the surface works better all right that is going not well for me but that's okay we'll keep practicing um i might need to address a little bit the threads here so i'm going to loosen this up and see if i can get this uh this side to loosen up a little bit and get it more centered on the screw. Because what I really want is two almost ideally even walking legs. And I you can see here that I'm a little off center. So I'm gonna see if I can help there. I'm gonna go back. Um, so that's, yeah, that's my kind of definition of a robot. Um, all right, let's talk about what inspired me. Well, I was very fortunate in uh, 1997 we landed a first rover on Mars. It was called the Sojourner Rover, the Pathfinder mission. Uh, and it also happened around the time, for those of you who are my age, uh, when we were getting the internet together. Uh, and it was, uh, you were able to go for the very first time. You could actually go still, if you Google uh, Mars Pathfinder website, you can actually go to the website as it existed in 1997. And you can see the very first pictures um, that we put kind of on the internet from Mars. And what was really cool about that mission to me um, and it's still very cool today because we still do this every time, is that we are able to put these pictures on the internet within about 24 hours of them coming from Mars. Uh, and that brought Mars to life for me in a way that reading about um, space and everything else never quite brought to life for me. Uh, you know, like when, when I, you know, reading a book and seeing a picture of Venus or a picture of uh, Mars or, or Saturn and everything, it's, it's amazing. Um, but you miss a little bit of the human part of it uh, because it almost feels like, you know, you could take it with a telescope or you could take it with some other thing and you don't realize that there's a very human part of it. Um, but with, with Pathfinder so Sojourner, right, we were able to see like live images. So the planet felt alive and we could see the robot itself because the base station had a camera on it and you could see this little rover um, driving around the surface. 
And I had no clue what the science was. Um, all I knew was that it was super cool and that, you know, for the first time, for me at least, I could really see the thing that people built um, on, a, on a different world. And it made me realize that that's a job. Like, I mean, right, once you can kind of see what people make, um, you know that there's a lot that goes into it and you can really appreciate it. And so from that kind of moment in 1997, uh, which was as I was graduating high school, that's when I kind of decided to go into aerospace engineering uh, and study kind of the, the spacecraft and, and aeronautic stuff. Um, and then uh, learn how to kind of operate from there. Let's see if I can get this to work this time. You guys, I am struggling with my little robot. It worked, it worked kind of like clowns around a little bit. If I shake this, it will walk a little bit. There we go. And so my, my felt surface might not be the best one, but you can kind of see this guy walking around. One-sided. Um, I see someone ask if it's best if the elastic is tight, tight as it can go. I think it's, you know, a, a little bit amount is good. It's over tight. It actually starts kinking up on itself inside. And so it doesn't look as good. I was trying to, trying to keep an eye on the middle and not see that I have any too many knots in there. Charlie, you want to try this with there's us? Another, you see if you there's can. another burning question in here. Yeah. Uh, go for it. Asks, be honest, how annoying is Gish to na No, we're not going to answer that one. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, somebody asked about AI. Uh, is it, oh yeah pros and cons? Like where where do we net out on all that these days? So it's interesting, you know, with um, with that kind of that time delay, we do have to build some sort of autonomy into our systems, um, mm -hmm. right? The robots do have to take care of themselves, and they do have to sort of be somewhat smart about it. But right now, everything is sort of programmed, right? We we kind of have a Here's a, you know, you're constantly evaluating your own health as a robot. Um, you're looking for what might have gone wrong, and then you you have sort of a pre-programmed set of actions that you can take to solve it. Um, and the, one of the reasons why it's pre-programmed is so that on the ground here on Earth, it's very predictable for us. Um, we want to know exactly what will happen in this condition, so that when when and when we do get in touch with the rover again, we know exactly how it's configured. Uh, this is just a, I'm using the rover as an example, but you can talk about any spacecraft here. Um, you want to know exactly how it's configured. You want to know what antenna it's using. You want to know how much power it's using, you know, things like that. Um, and so predictability is kind of, of key there. As you kind of get towards the more and more complex robots, uh, right, with multiple computers on board and things like that, it's harder and harder to kind of pre-program every condition, uh, right? The job kind of grows very exponentially. If you think of a, you know, um, our earlier robots, they were what we call single string. So they had one computer on board and one set of power electronics and one sort of, you know, one set of uh, X or Y. And so like, you really didn't have necessarily a lot of choices, but as you get to the, oh, I have two computers on board, they can both talk to two different radios. And then those two things can use two different sets of power electronics, right? You can do like two times two times two, right? And you very quickly to get to eight different combinations. And so it goes really fast. And so that's where, you know, people are looking at using AI um, to help us, at least in the robotics field. Uh, but then of course you have a lot of things where it's just, it's a, a mundane task, right? For us like driving and people are looking at AI and autonomy as a way of kind of alleviating some of the stresses and difficulties associated with the, you know, the mundane tasks that, you know, again, ideally we don't want to all have to do all the time. I know that I don't love driving necessarily. Um, so it's kind of a cool, uh, thing, but right there, there are obviously folks who are concerned that at some point AI uh, and and the thing with kind of technology is that it does sort of quickly levy on itself, right? So as computers become faster, you can then use faster computers to de design even faster computers, uh, and so on and so forth. And there are people who want to think, you know, going forward, how do you set in place a set of rules so that we uh, understand the trajectory and we are kind of an active participant rather than a passive participant. Um, in that process of, of how AI gets deployed, how what it what it means to everyday lives, um, you know the benefits of having AI and, and maybe some of the negatives, right? I think you know people are definitely understandably worried that like will AI replace my job, um, and that is a real thing that we need to like as a society have a, a conversation about. So it's a really cool area of research. Um, obviously, a lot of the stuff you see right now is kind of using the machine learning approach to it, right? There's uh, basically where you feed it information. And then you uh, use it, you use a model to predict, you know, the, based on that information, what it will do. And then if it does the wrong thing, you tell it, no, that was a bad thing. And if it was the right thing, you say, yeah, you did the right thing. And each time that model can be tweaked a little bit so that, it, you know, on, on the whole, it gets better and better each time. 
Um, that's kind of what you see with the driving. It's what you see with a lot of uh, you know computational tools like that. There will be a point where you know that that's a, that's one approach to it, and then of course we're going to see other approaches. And and the interesting thing about the, the machine learning is a lot of what happens in the middle we don't fully control ourselves, and that's where people might be concerned, right? Um, I, I wouldn't yeah. say be, should be scared. Um, but we should be, you know, concerned about how that gets used and what do we understand all the things, right? And I was talking about with robotic spacecraft, we like predictability. We like to know exactly what the outcome is. Um, it's interesting, right? As you get to a sort of more nebulous, A happens, a bunch of other stuff, you don't really know exactly how it works, happens, and then outcome usually very good, right? 99%, whatever reliability. But not knowing what happens in the middle can sometimes be a challenge for those of us who are, who are trying to figure out with you know something so far away and very little data, exactly what it did, right? If the if the robot said, "I've decided to use part A here, part B here, part you know C over here," that's great. But if then I want to say like, "Okay, which part broke?" I might not know that answer. Um, and so that's kind of where we're getting like the very interesting parts of the the AI and the question of like, you know, do I really understand it? How do I know? Um, you know, let's say uh, one of these AI systems does have a mishap. Right. How do I know what caused the mishap? Um, and it's kind of an interesting challenge because we don't fully understand the code in the same way that, you know, you think of traditional code. I do like if A, then B or while mm -hmm. X do Y kind of stuff. Um, it's a challenge. It's a really interesting thing. That was a super long explanation. I hope people didn't get no, super bored by my this is, Well, no, it's a huge <laughs> question. It's, you know, the more responsibility yeah. we give on machines to make life easier or automate those tasks, the more purview or scope of work that they have. The more responsibility there than given to sort of like automate these things. If we start getting into like healthcare or any of these other fields where human life is at stake or those kinds of things, like we have to have some of those answers sussed out. There's an ethical, moral quandary all around that. Um, yeah, but and I think I, the and simplicity hope, of it you know, is great. Yeah, and I and I, I I mean with all this technology, uh, I really more than anything want people to be a part of it, right? I think that's the really I like that people are excited about AI because. I think I, I want society deciding how AI gets used and not right, a handful of people who kind of think they know better, right, so to speak, um, than everybody else. And so that's what's really neat. You know, I think with the technology that we have already in our hand and, and the fact that yeah. there's so much accessible information, um, you know, you want people to be like, okay, where should we use AI? What benefits society? Like what, what does the best good for, for all of us? Yeah, and yeah. there's a lot of questions I'm seeing too about, you know, kids getting into this field or if people are interested in the field, you know, where can we point them to? Are we pointing them to mechanics and math? Are we pointing them to Lego? Like, what, what do you see as like some building blocks for how you've gotten to where you are? Yeah, I mean, I love Lego as a kid and I still do. Um, I still, I still, you know, buy a lot of the space Lego when they come up. Um, there's just something very satisfying about it. Uh, that helped me a lot, I think, with the physical understanding of the world, you know, like how things move and interact with each other. Yeah. Uh, one of the really cool things that didn't exist when I was a kid, but I love seeing it so much now in schools is kind of like the first robotics program and things like that, uh, where, you know, uh, there's Lego robotics and other things, but there's just so many more tools and kind of computational power involved. Uh, and most of those things really involve a lot of teamwork, which is something that I don't think um, as a kid, I necessarily really understood, right, the, the job, right, you think about a, a rover or a spacecraft, it takes thousands of people um, to make those happen. And it really is a huge team effort. And I don't think as a kid, I, you know, building Lego was like me doing it by myself. Um, the cool thing about like first robotics and stuff is you're a team, right, you have to work together, somebody's going to work on the wheels, another person's going to work on the, you know, the remote controller, another person might even be doing fundraising, right, which is a, a part of the engineering job that most people don't think about, but you're like, I got to get money to build the stuff that I want to do in the future. Um, so it's really cool to me that like, there's so many of those responsibilities, and then the fact that you get to work with other team members and, and kind of figure out what you like a lot. Totally. Well, um, do you mind if we pull a couple of people in here to see how their bots are doing and sort of critique? And maybe yeah, I'd love to. I, I, I want to see if anybody did better than me. I hope some people did better than I did. <laughs> well, it's good that you you can figure out how be... systems fail. We maybe we can do that in real time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's going. It's totally going. Um, it yeah, Mod, I have to keep shaking it. I think it's a little stuck on my surface. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. Let, let's see uh, some yeah, other folks. Mods, let's pull some people in uh, to uh, who've raised their hand. So raise your hand if you've completed building your own little bot. Uh, we also have a bot. We have Gishbot, who constantly throws us for a loop in our tech building for the website and for team merging and things like that. So Gishbot, if you're watching, uh, maybe we can talk to Bobak about um, maybe some upgrades for you at some point soon, because uh, your old binary code is not not really holding up anymore. <laughs> Hi, Katarina. Hi. How are you? 
Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Good. Um, do you mind showing us your bot? Yes. Uh, I mean, okay. I don't mind. <laughs> I said yes. Okay. <laughs> Here it is. I just have to find um, why. Why is it blurred? I don't know why it's blurred. But oh, it cool. Work. Yeah, it looks good. I just need to find the surface to put it on. Let's see. Oh. It's very slow. Oh, it's doing it. It's doing it. Yeah, there it goes. There it I goes. Did it. Yes. You got it. Mission <laughs> yeah, this feels like Mars. I mean, the robots move very slow on Mars, so very good Martian. Simply so, but there. you did it. Good work. <laughs> I good love work. it. It looks so like it's working Katerina. so hard, and I really appreciate it for that. Where are you from, Katarina? Up, oh, she's gone. Hi, Angie. Or hi. Hi. Here's my robot. Nice to meet you all. Hello. I didn't have any screws, so I used paper clips. And then well, improvisation. Oh. Yes. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> the the lighter weight of the paper clips, how would that affect that rollback? Is that something that maybe could help? Like as long as the mass of those are enough to sort of pull torque to push it, like how would that work? Yeah, I mean, the only thing with paper clips that will, is is harder is that the, the surface friction is a little lower, right? So like I was trying to use a felt surface so that I had a pointy object and kind of anchor it. Sorry, I'm doing that below with the surface. Um, but uh, if you have paper clips, of course, it might slip a little bit. So you need a little bit of friction there for it to pivot around the the leg part of it, right? So you want, nice. you want this part to pivot. Um, so if it slips too much, it'll just slide under itself. But yeah, it should still move. Just might move more in place than moving forward. Yeah, Angie, it looks great. It looks like it's, yeah, it's it moving. actually looks cooler with the paper clips. I'll be honest. <laughs> Thank you. It's like, like big rims on your car. Like yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you, Angie. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, we we have time for maybe one more, and then we're going to be wrapping up here in a minute. Um, yeah. And uh, we've got a couple other questions too. Do you have a dream robot that you? you wish were built or that you'd like to build? Is there something like maybe not work related, maybe, but personally for you? Um, I, I really do. Uh, I have a weird obsession with like those 1980s robots that are kind of like just talk to you very robotically and bring you drinks. And honestly, that's been like a pet product of mine. Uh, the other one that I would love to do is if anybody watched the 1986 Space Camp movie, there's a, a robot called Jinx in there. Oh, I love that movie. Uh, I love that movie. I, I want that robot. Like I want to build my own little robot that's sassy and walks around and says it's my best friend. So that's pretty that's much awesome. all I want. I love that movie. I wanted to go to space camp so bad after that movie. I swear to God, I I was obsessed. Same. I went. I finally went a little later in life, um, but it's awesome. It's uh, it's really fun to. I've actually gone as an adult to space camp, and it's still really exciting uh, to oh, go. That that should be a winter yeah. trip for Gish one time. Like to send everybody to space camp. I Amazing. will help. I will help set that up if I can. Absolutely. Incredible. We'd love it. Uh, Taylor. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm. I'm okay. Okay. Good. We're glad, we're glad to have you. Everybody. I'm. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, this is my my little robot. I have a surface I can show you it on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look at it. It's gonna fall. Off. Wow, it's working pretty well. It's doing yeah, great. Have good. you ever have you ever built a robot before? No, <laughs> I think incredible. maybe one in like sixth grade. Nice. So, well, now you have fun. your own robot. <laughs> you built a yeah, robot, Taylor. It's, it's so really rad. cute. Um, know, how's the how's the how's everyone. this? You should. You should be like, I'm kind of a big deal in the robot space. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Taylor. Have a great hunt, you okay? You too. Bye. Bye. I'll try. Bullback, thank you so much for coming out and uh, sharing your Yeah, my pleasure. Um, everybody go follow Bullback. Uh, tweet so loud. Uh, tweet out loud. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to put it up on the yeah. screen again. Let me put that up so everybody can see it. So uh, 
Anything else you want to be promoting, Bobek? Anything you're working on that you can talk about? I know there's a lot probably you can't talk about in the world of uh, of your work. Uh, no, I'm just it's honestly I love I love work. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I would just highly recommend if you guys want to check out the NASA uh, website. There's always amazing pictures, and we're always doing stuff, and I think it's super cool. But also, I just want to thank everybody for participating. Um, like I said, I, I'm working on a project with India right now, and, and so many of our colleagues there are. Um, you know, staying safe and staying and uh, in, indoors and everything, but uh, I, I know how bad it is. And so it really means a lot that uh, everybody's participating today. Well, I've got great news about that, actually. Um, we have hit 117% of the goal while you were talking. Your Amazing. robotics demonstration. Yeah. Uh, 20, I'm sorry, is that my, am I reading that right? Is that $29,000 in two and a half hours? $29,000 has been raised. That's like awesome. Gisher's going out and getting five people they know to donate ten dollars. That's it. We're not telling people you do not have to donate. Do not donate. Go out to your network. Go out to your family, your bubble. Go ask for supporting a country because, as we've said before, we are not okay until we're all okay. And the people of India need your help. And you are you are showing up. And uh, we've moved the goal now to thirty five thousand instead of twenty five thousand. And just know that every thousand dollars is providing 20 families with meals with ppe and an oxygen concentrator that can be reused for potentially hundreds of people as they get better and get the support that they actually need people are walking around in hospital hallways not able to go anywhere cremation and 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 after life care is not possible uh, there's there are there's such a desperate need right now in india and and what you're doing, 100% of those dollars are going directly to uh, help people in need. So stunning, stunning. Uh, so thank you so much, and thank you, Bobak, again for coming for coming by. And 100% space camp. Big hugs to everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. Have All a good right, one, Bobak. Everybody. Uh, everybody, follow Bobak and, and barrage Bobak on social media. Okay, go follow Bobak. And ask your questions, by the way. I saw there were many other questions. Feel free to just at me or whatever, and I will try to answer your questions. So, Amazing. Have a Thanks great again. one. Bye, guys. Take care.